Thomas wants to know what this spiritual world is and starts off by asking, Quemst, is it located? Well, mathematically... Oh boy, here we go. Hit me with that mathematics, AJ. I've proven that we there, there are 13 or so concurrent dimensional spaces in the universe. There are 13 concurrent dimensional spaces in the universe. If what AJ is saying is correct, then he could be holding the answers for a cure for all known diseases. Are you insane? You chose to put that in the documentary immediately after he specifies what emotional issues towards women causes cancer of the left breast. Hi, it's me. <laughs> Hello lovely people, welcome back to my channel. Welcome if you are new. What are we doing today? Oh, it's hot, it's so hot. It's supposed to cool down like tomorrow, but I'm away shooting a short film tomorrow. So sweaty Emma it is. Usual summer disclaimer, if you can hear the fan, I do apologize. Hopefully my voice should be coming in clear enough that it doesn't actually cause you any issues, but if it's annoying, I'm really sorry. It's too hot to film without it. So sweat aside, what are we doing today? Well, first of all, in case it upsets anyone, today's t-shirt is Weird Coffee Person. This was a gift from my friend David. It is very accurate to my vibe and my mood and my lifestyle. So today we are going to be talking about a documentary. Not a new documentary, this documentary is called For the Love of God, not to be confused with the one about Mother Teresa of, I believe, the same name. How dare that documentary come out later and cause confusion for me. This is not a new documentary, I watched this a while ago and I went on a, a brief Twitter rant about how I didn't like it. In those days it was called tweeting. But you know what they say? showing is always better than telling and i thought this would be a fun one to go through with you guys because if i know you and i think i do you'll get as much of a kick as i did out of this australian guy who claims to be jesus christ i have employed the cork board there's not a lot going on on the cork board today not a lot of players in this documentary i am also employing my new pointer that is way too long when i mentioned getting a new pointer a few people were distressed people really like the hello kitty chopstick and i get it I do. But this was sent to me by a lovely viewer, so we should at least try it. Also, in my mind, it looks a little bit like a teeny sonic screwdriver, and I like that, so let's try it out. Also, I get to do that and feel like a school teacher. Now class, the documentary. Before we kick off today, that is so satisfying. Uh-oh, it's going to become a fidget toy. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm gonna put it in my pocket when I don't need it, so I'm not tempted. Before we kick off today, I am very pleased to tell you that today's video is sponsored by Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon make a variety of very tasty cereals. They have that childlike nostalgia, but with zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five net grams of carbs in each serving. They're only 140 calories per serving. If you are one of those people, unlike myself, who can commit to some kind of lifestyle choice, you'll be pleased to know that Magic Spoon is also grain free, keto friendly, soy free, wheat free, it's high protein, it's naturally flavoured, all of the good stuff. It's basically cereal like you remember from childhood, but the grown up version. I find it really good for not just breakfast, but also snacky snacks. You may click the link below to get your own Magic Spoon cereal today. You can build your very own bundle and use my code EMMATHORN for $5 off at checkout. There are so very many flavours to choose from. You've got cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, maple waffle, uh, honey nut, blueberry muffin, birthday cake, cinnamon roll, chocolate chip cookie. <sighs> I'm back on the fruity again. I just love it so much. It smells like sweets, <laughs> but without the sugar, it's so nice. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, they have a 100% happiness guarantee. That means if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. Click the link below or scan the QR code. Use my code EMMATHORN for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash EMMATHORN. And a reminder to my fellow Brits and Canadian friends, Magic Spoon does ship to Canada and the UK. We're included! Thank you so much for listening and to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video and my rumbly tummy. Rumbly tummy. Let's jump straight into the documentary. This documentary is made by Thomas Leader. He comes across as a generally pretty nice chap, I don't want to be too mean to him. He has since made other documentaries that are better reviewed. I do think he does a terrible job in this documentary, and that will become clear as we go on. I think because I was watching this having seen it before and already been biased against him, I don't like the way he talks at the beginning, I don't know why. I've been given exclusive access to what the media has described as one of the world's most worrying cult leaders. I'm gonna try not to be too mean to the documentarian, but... 
I do think he makes mistakes and I'm gonna point them out. The production and the editing are very smooth, so... My main problem with this documentary is I do not think they challenged people nearly enough, to the point where it presents this cult in a very positive light. You can probably already see why I have issues. The documentary jumps straight into introducing AJ, which does not stand for another guy who claims to be Jesus Christ. His name is Alan John Miller, although he was born in the first century as Jesus of Nazareth. Which is a little weird since he was supposed to be born in Bethlehem, I guess it was preemptive naming, I don't know. One of the things that stood out to me here is, uh, he has glasses! <laughs> Jesus can heal the sick and the blind and he's perfect and without sin. Why in the hell does he need driving glasses? Is this some kind of god prank? How arrogant is that and, and what a wanker. Wanker, messiah complex, eh, something like that. I find the whiteboard thing so strange. He uses the whiteboard so often and Divine Truth, his ministry, has a YouTube channel in which he whiteboards all of the goddamn time. Anytime you see a whiteboard used like this on YouTube, it is 100% conspiracy theorist. I put whiteboard AJ as his own thing, oh dear. My corkboard is still resting on the big pick and mix tub. I'm sorry, okay, I haven't had the time to figure out a new solution to this whole setup, okay? I've been very busy doing my musical theatre course. <laughs> I put whiteboard AJ up as his own person because the whiteboarding thing is just... He's a character unto himself. He teaches his followers prophecy and how to properly be close to God. All this stuff, they have a YouTube channel for the ministry. I just can't imagine Jesus Christ laying out all this complexity like... The image of Jesus I have in my head is like a storyteller who shared moral lessons. There's something uniquely conspiracy-esque about whiteboard guys on YouTube that is just un-Christ-like to me. For some reason, one minute in, we rush straight into a first-person retelling of AJ's own death at the hands of the Romans. Isn't it funny how often these guys look like stereotypical modern depictions of Jesus. There's like a rule or something that you've got to grow your hair out. And actually, I remember who I am. Like, I understand who I am now. That's right, folks. AJ's partner, Mary Luck, also claims to be Mary Magdalene. I'll give you one guess as to who told her she was Mary Magdalene. So here's something the documentary doesn't mention at all. Uh, since we're introducing AJ in this opening section. This opening section, by the way, is all over the fucking place. Here's something they don't mention. When AJ Miller was a young man, he was a Jehovah's Witness. A high-performing Jehovah's Witness who rose to the rank of church elder. I'm sure that growing up in a cult-like religious organisation had no influence on his realisation that he is Jesus Christ at all. All. AJ used to be a property developer and IT professional. Yep, he used to be an IT guy and then realised he was Jesus. <laughs> Midlife crisis? I would love to know more about his life at the time, to understand that realisation better. Thomas isn't going to really ask him about it. Five years ago, he met Mary Luck, who believes she is Mary Magdalene. I find this misleading because the phrasing here implies she believed she was Mary Magdalene before she met Australian Jesus. Not so. Thomas finds his way to the alleged compound and finds it surprisingly empty. Not in fact a compound at all. There's no barbed wire, it's just a two bedroom house where AJ and Mary live together. Which gives them a great opportunity to talk about how the naysayers are making up conspiracies about them. Sympathy, sympathy. Not a criticism because it's true and it's important to report the truth and the exaggerations about their compound and all these women living there are exaggerations, and it's important to point that out, but this is definitely garnering a lot of sympathy off the bat for AJ and Mary, all of the unfair lies being spread about them, you know? Here's a truth that, again, the documentary doesn't mention. A lot of the followers of AJ and Mary, the followers of Divine Truth, did indeed move to be near to AJ and Mary, but AJ didn't tell them to. He's just out here innocently claiming to be Jesus Christ, and People want to be near him? That's so crazy, what are they thinking? It's not his fault. Thomas takes a second to remind us plebs that Christians and Muslims believe in the second coming of Christ, <laughs> in case we forgot. But also that Jesus warns us himself about the haters and the fakers. Okay, just the fakers. I just felt like I should add in haters there because it sounded kind of neat. <laughs> Thomas takes this line of thought to AJ, who surprises us with his knowledge of other current Jesus Christs around the world. Again, 
the stereotypical Jesusness of these guys. Come back in three days because I am deceased. Even in Australia, I've had three people ring me up claiming to be me. <laughs> Is Jesus getting those Telegram spammers too? It's not me, guys. I don't have Telegram. I don't even really know what Telegram is. And I don't have the money to give away computers and guitars. AJ puts this worrisome question of all the other fake Jesus Christs to bed by assuring us that he has more extensive knowledge than any of them, and he's more loving. So I'm convinced. Most of the time I get the opposite emotion that I am stupid and, and an idiot. <laughs> uh huh, uh huh. Thomas dives in with the big question why does AJ believe he's JC? AJ gives us the ideal stock response I don't believe I'm JC. I know I am. He basically says he just remembers his life like anybody else, except his life spans 2,000 years. And he forgot about most of it until he was 2,040 years old. <laughs> but wait! Actually, he remembers remembering most of his life in the first century at two years old in this incarnation. Now, I thought this was interesting because two years old is around the age we're first able to store biographical memories. I reckon, and this is just a reckon, I reckon AJ knew that and convinced himself that his first memories of his past life were at two. Just a hunch. And let's talk about memory real quick. Children can be susceptible to false memories. Adults too, but children even more so. Have you ever thought that you've remembered a childhood event and then sort of realised that actually you've just been told the story a lot by someone and seen a photograph of it a lot or something? False memory is a real psychological condition that affects people. The most common causes of false memories are interference, leading questions, let's talk in a bit about how AJ approached Mary with the news that she's actually Mary Magdalene, False memory syndrome, go figure. Sleep deprivation and obsessive compulsive disorder, amongst other things. Sometimes also the cause is just unknown because human brain, am I right? Yeah. The satanic panic of the 1980s is a brilliant example of how recovered memory therapy uses tactics like interference, leading questions, hypnosis, guided imagery, etc. to create false memories. There are lots of really interesting books and articles on false memory, in particular relating to uh, witness testimony and its unreliability, so I'll leave it to you to look it up if you're interested, and I'll leave a couple of sources that I looked at in the description. The concept of false memory is something that I would have loved to see Thomas ask AJ and Mary about, to see what their thoughts are. He didn't, so... We'll never know. <laughs> AJ says, and this will be important later, he doesn't have all his memories back yet because he has fear associated with some of them. I'm not a psychiatrist, but to me, it sounds like AJ is doing recovered memory therapy on himself. AJ tells us his life is one singular life. It's not that he was Jesus Christ and now he is AJ Miller. It's one continuous life. Basically, he remembers being Jesus dying, returning to Earth, being a spirit, and then living as AJ the IT man. I don't know why it's funny that he was an IT guy. Is it possible that somehow I've created this experience because I have a deep underlying desire to be special or have attention? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Or, more likely, AJ's influence created false memories and ideas that only became more convincing the more you fixated on them. Say you're a man, which statistically you are. A divorcee, let's say, and you meet a beautiful woman 10 years your junior. You also believe that you are Jesus Christ. What better way to convince this lovely woman to be with you than to tell her she was your wife in previous incarnations, 2000 years ago? In fact, you like her so much, it's probably true. You just get this really strong feeling that she was Mary Magdalene. You're soulmates, baby! It's easier to do than you would think. Blame the human brain. Back to AJ, because we have no more pressing questions for Mary now, I guess. AJ is like, it's hard being Jesus, actually. Sometimes it feels like I can't even tell people. Thank goodness for all the practice he's had on chat shows and interviews then. AJ goes on to explain that no one of any faith, no one on the entire planet, actually knows Jesus. They always ask, what would Jesus do? But never, how is Jesus do? So it turns out AJ started his ministry, Divine Truth, before coming clean about being Jesus. Depending on what you believe about AJ, it's not inconceivable that someone would make that decision as an escalation of their preaching. There's no way for us to know without being inside his brain, so we're just speculating. I'm just throwing out alternative possibilities to what AJ claims, because... For some reason, this documentary about this cult, 99% of it just takes 
the cult leaders, the alleged cult leaders, word for it on everything. Like, everything. So, AJ and Mary are holding a seminar, a two-day seminar, in a nearby town hall. Thomas thinks this is a great opportunity to decide whether or not divine truth is a cult. That's not how you work out if something is a cult, Thomas. Uh, not that that's something that he's made clear, or even indicates knowing, so... Whatever, I guess. I feel like this documentary uses cult as a buzzword instead of a concept with definitions that we can actually use. As we get a bit further along, I'm going to start using the bite model when it becomes relevant, so... You know, at least someone is doing something. <laughs> These seminars are free and AJ and Mary live on donations. Pretty common in this kind of... organization. And I'm told they use these funds to give to others and to distribute divine truth material. Well, if they told you that, then it's fine, isn't it? No need to look any deeper into that. Here's where we get into the problematic teachings, the emotional trauma that followers of AJs are encouraged to subject themselves to. And unless they confront and process these often extremely painful emotions, they will never be free, never know the truth that lies beneath, or feel the purity of their soul. Followers are taught that they will never know their true selves or have a pure soul if they don't confront their painful experiences. This gets pretty rough, so trigger warning for mentions of death coming up. Thomas decides to speak to some followers of Divine Truth to see why they sought this organisation out. We first meet a lovely chap called Jason. Jason first started learning about Divine Truth when his son passed away. It was a full-term stillbirth. Very traumatising experience and a very vulnerable emotional state to be in. His wife went to a seminar of AJ's to find out what this is all about, but chiefly why their son died. Jason says that AJ is probably the most loving person he's ever met in his life. Which lines up with a couple of things that we expect from cults. Number one, that the leader is extremely charismatic, usually a great sense of humour, very lovely to be around. And two, an emotional tactic known as love bombing. Love bombing might seem like a stretch at this point, but because throughout the documentary and from Divine Truth followers we hear so many people talk about how loving and how kind and how loving and how we see him hugging people left, right and centre, I can't say for definite, but I wouldn't be surprised if love bombing was a tactic that was involved. I have a part in the death of my son. Yeah, so this is why I believe that Divine Truth is an emotionally abusive cult that deserves the spotlight. You affect everything around you. It's not the other way around. It's not the world affecting me. That's right. Divine Truth teaches the law of attraction. Manifestation, in the most extreme sense. That your actions and your feelings and your lack of knowledge of God, who apparently n nobody in the world knows God properly, apart from AJ Miller, the IT guy, they so affect the world around you they can in part cause the death of your own child. This man is having this belief reinforced regularly. Confronting this guilt is a core teaching he believes, so he'll be forced to re-examine this traumatic event and his own supposed part in it over and over again, putting himself at fault for something that he had no part in. And that's happening over and over again, probably for the rest of his life, at the time of filming it had been two years. With no hope to just process and move on, he's being encouraged by a man who thinks he's Jesus Christ to wallow in this horrific thing. Not just this horrific thing that happened to him, but that he believes he is responsible for. It's fucking disgusting. Jason explains AJ's teaching that man's soul degeneration is so severe that we are born with a debt that is passed on through the generations. Basically, anything bad that happens to you is not just your fault, but also probably your great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother's fault. What's more, in sleep state, AJ teaches that you can apparently communicate with your deceased loved ones. Two quick things here. One, soul degeneration and sleep state. What is another powerful tactic that cults like to employ? The use of their own... I don't know why I'm doing friggin' finger guns and shit. Yeah, this is how you start a cult, kids. <laughs> use of their own unique language. They have these bizarre terms that if you just heard these things all stated in a list, you'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about? We'll talk more about this later, but just keep an ear out for those examples as we go. I've also got a list of uh, traits of a cult leader. Uh, we talked about the charismatic one earlier. This sleep state business I would also put on that list as part of the having supernatural powers part. Although obviously he claims to be Jesus Christ and have in the past done miracles and resurrected, so I feel like 
we probably already could have ticked that one off. Jason talks about the hours after his son's death, and I won't go into any details, but it sounds very traumatizing, let's just say. AJ believes many of Jason's views are in contrast with his teachings. AJ believes. So we'll hear from more followers later that confirm these are, in fact, AJ's teachings. But again, it seems like Thomas is so ready to believe whatever AJ tells him. In my opinion, for the sake of transparency, he should have said, AJ says that Jason's views are contradictory to his teachings. Because based on what we hear from other people later on, they aren't contradictory at all. And where has he conjured this information from? He's learning from divine truth, what he's just accidentally got AJ's teachings all wrong. Kinda sus, but again, Thomas is just happy to take AJ's word for it because he's just so charming and nice. He can't be a bad cult leader. AJ told me the complexities of the divine truth belief system are not always fully understood. The complexities of the divine truth belief system. I'll translate this into regular human speak for you. The inconsistencies in the teachings and or between the teachings and what AJ tells interviewers are hidden behind the excuse of complexity. Oh, Jason's just got that wrong because the teachings are very complex. So it might sound like we've said that at one point, but it's just more complicated. You just don't really get it because I know everything because I'm Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Basically, if a Divine Truth follower appears to be applying some distressing teaching or belief, it's not the responsibility of the leader, of the teacher, it's that follower's own fault or mistake. Cult, cult, cult! Thomas asks a pretty rudimentary question next, one that every brave toddler probably asks their local preacher, far less important than the unasked questions about this cult, in my opinion. Why is there suffering? Why is there disease? Which gives AJ the opportunity to explain that our body should be able to fight off all diseases as long as we are in harmony with love. So that answers that question. It's your fault. Law of attraction. Now, both of my grandparents have experienced cancer. One skin and one breast both recovered well, but it did happen. My mum has a chronic illness that causes her constant pain and fatigue, and that is incurable. I would love to see AJ tell me face to face that those things happened because my family members didn't have enough love in their souls. I'd fucking nut him. If you're not familiar with the phrase, to fucking nut someone, it would be this. Ooh. Whoa, it is too hot to do that. Anything that occurs inside the body of any individual occurs because of the environmental conditions that have created soul-based feelings inside of the individual. Quick, someone tell the scientists! All these kind souls dedicating their lives to studying diseases and cancers in the hopes of developing treatments, they're all wasting their time! We just need to let more love into our souls. Replace all the labs in the world with video feeds direct to divine truth and AJ and his whiteboard. Watch too many of my videos and you're at risk of silly little guy disease. You're welcome. Okay, skip to the end. We're stuck in a bit of a repetitive cycle in this part of the dock where AJ is just going off and off about how every disease is caused by emotions and lack of love. Just to give you kind of the funniest highlight, regarding cancer, he says the place in which the cancer starts relates to the emotional cause. The example he gives, if a woman gets breast cancer in her left breast, that's because she has an emotional issue with women, probably her mother. It's wanting to receive approval from women that causes cancer to develop in the left breast. The right breast is to do with men. Yeah, this guy is definitely Jesus. He's so fucking smart. In my opinion, this is kind of an editing faux pas. Maybe the documentary needed to be an hour long so they filled time by letting AJ say the same things over and over. Bored, move on. I will say this part is interspersed with reaction shots of Thomas looking vaguely concerned, which I'll admit is pretty endearing. I've had this experience, being stuck in a confined space with someone going off on an increasingly insane diatribe. I get it, Thomas. If what AJ is saying is correct, then he could be holding the answers for a cure for all known diseases. And I'm back off the Thomas train. <laughs> Are you insane? If what AJ is saying is correct, how could it possibly be? If it turns out he is Jesus Christ and he knows how diseases develop from his time as a spiritual being. Are you insane? You chose to put that in the documentary immediately after he specifies what emotional issues towards women causes cancer of the left breast. <laughs> and we're supposed to consider Thomas a reliable narrator. If what AJ is saying is true, fuck me. Giving Thomas the benefit of the doubt in the strongest way possible, 
I think this has to be an attempt at being unbiased, gone sideways. He just sounds like a numpty who's starting to be convinced by this IT guy claiming he's Jesus. Are we seeing where I have problems with this documentary? <laughs> Next, Thomas wants to get to the bottom of some claims that AJ's mother I just knocked over my ukulele. Thomas wants to get to the bottom of some claims that AJ's mother was worried about him that he might have mental health issues. Which in my opinion is a pretty reasonable concern when your son goes off on insane universal truth whiteboard seminars, even without claiming to be Jesus Christ reborn. In answer to this, AJ tells us that actually both his mothers, aka AJ's real mother and Mary mother of Jesus Christ, were worried that he had mental health issues. Which is kind of forward thinking of a first century woman. In those days you would have expected her to think that he was possessed by demons or some shit, but no, she was she was really up with the uh, psychological medical issues, I guess. AJ's present life mother was worried. AJ went to the doctor and according to his words, because here's a reminder the documentary seems fine to ignore, we're exclusively given AJ's own testimony, which we have no means to corroborate, we're just taking his word for it. The doctor met him and was okay about it, presumably because yeah, it seems like this delusion is not impacting AJ's life in a way that's causing him particular stress. He's certainly able to be lovely and charming and not mention his nightmares and fears about his past life, so what's a doctor gonna do? Again, one of the common traits of a cult leader is narcissism, which is famously very difficult to diagnose because it requires a high level of honesty from the individual. Which, if you're a narcissist cult leader, I'm not saying that's what AJ is. I'm just throwing out information. Alternatives. Possibilities. Eventually, AJ says, his mum was like, yeah, he seems totally fine, and she was even regretful that she had worried about his mental health, which I feel like in this situation was perfectly natural. I feel like she was worried, he sought help, it turned out he was fine. I don't think she should feel any regret. I think she did the right thing. But then AJ loves shame, regret, and guilt, and thinks we should revolve our lives around those emotions, so... What do I know? My whiteboard is much smaller than AJ's, so I am clearly intellectually inferior. It's not the size of your whiteboard, guys. It's how you use it. So, AJ has two sons from a previous marriage, from back in his time as a Jehovah's Witness. We meet his son, Tristan, who definitely believes his father is Jesus. Tristan tells us about AJ's coming out as Jesus. Apparently it was a very emotional time in which AJ was processing a lot of grief, the memories of torture, etc. And I can't help but feel, if AJ had presented these facts honestly to a doctor, he might have been referred to psychiatric evaluation. Honestly, I don't know what the healthcare system is like in Australia. You tell me, Aussie friends. Statistically, some of you are Australians, so let me know in the comments. If it's total garbage and that sort of thing can slip through easily, yeah, tell me. Otherwise, my immediate suspicion is that AJ was not completely forthcoming with doctors. He was in bed crying, screaming, shaking um, for, a, for a, would be up to about six months. See what I mean? Six months of emotional torment all day, every day, as the result of delusions and false memories doesn't sound like something a doctor would ignore to me. I don't know. When asked about this time in his life, you're gonna love this. AJ reveals that at 33, that's the age Jesus died, probably. People suspected he had Parkinson's due to constant tremors. Now, tremors can be caused by a variety of things, including Parkinson's, but also damage to the brain as a result of strokes, excessive alcohol consumption, reactions to certain drugs, stress, anxiety, fatigue, over-caffeination. These can all cause tremors. A lot of the time, the causes of tremors are just unknown. AJ puts his down to fear and stress, which sounds pretty legitimate to me. If I thought I had been tortured and killed and then resurrected three days later and was having nightmare memories about it, I might get the fucking shakes. It sucks. This is where things get so tricky as a viewer and a critic, because it's easy, especially when he's wearing his fucking glasses with his microphone and his whiteboard pen teaching his insane version of the law of attraction to as many people as possible. It's easy to be pissed off at this guy. I think it's a fair guess to say he most likely triggered Mary's delusions and his son's delusional belief in him. The people who follow him are instructed to ruminate on the most harrowing experiences of their lives and blame themselves for them. On the surface, that's evil. However, AJ does come across as someone who is not fucking about for personal gain. As the documentary does show, he's not dripping in riches or women or anything like that. I think he really 
does believe this, and it sounds like he really has suffered terribly at the hands of these delusional beliefs. He is also a victim of something we can't easily blame, whether it's a mental health issue, a psychological phenomenon that caused this delusion in an otherwise healthy person. I think he believes everything he said and has suffered terribly as a result. Rachel Bernstein is a therapist who works with former cult members, and she believes there are three different types of cult leaders, the most dangerous of which is a delusional martyr. A very appropriate title in the case of Mr. A. Jesus Miller. Here's a quote from an article which I'll link for you down below. Bernstein said she considers a delusional cult leader the most dangerous because they can use their unyielding beliefs to convince others to buy into the delusion. The National Institute of Health identifies this group delusion as a diagnosable condition called shared psychotic disorder. I won't make a conclusion or a diagnostic here because that wouldn't be responsible. I will just say that AJ and his followers, including those in his family who share his beliefs, seem perfectly genuine which makes them potentially very dangerous. It turns out that seven couples have returned from the spirit realm to inhabit this earth. I don't know why they've all come back now at the same time, I don't know if some other people resurrected at different points in the past, or if it was like 2,000 years of nothing, 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 14 people resurrected. AJ casually reveals that one of the 14 resurrected people was murdered. We get no further information on that. He carries on to say this 14, now 13, a uh, resurrected bro's team is great because they'll be able to spread divine truth much further if the others decide to join in. One of AJ's neighbours, ah oh shit, one of AJ's neighbours, Dave, is also a resurrected being. It's either really fucking lucky that most of these people are Australian, or God picked Australia for the resurrected party home, in which case, why lol? <laughs> no offence to Australian viewers, it's just, it seems very hot and on fire and a lot of spiders, I don't know. On the other hand, all the best mermaid TV shows are made in Australia. In fact, like 50% of the childhood TV that I loved was made in Australia. I mean, you can't say fairer than that. Dave tells us about being born in the first century in Sicily. Once again, his memories are extremely traumatic. He was taken from his family by Roman soldiers, the sexual assault. He starts to get very emotional telling Thomas about this. The documentary never asks, so we don't know, whether Dave believed this before Divine Truth and meeting AJ slash Jesus. I'm going to assume, because it would be hella coincidence otherwise, I'm going to assume that he realised and remembered this after meeting AJ. Or after learning about divine truth. Dave, or Cornelius, was his first century name. Let's just call him Dave Nelius. Dave Nelius had slaves. One of his slaves got sick, so he took them to this guy who supposedly could heal them, and that guy was Jesus Christ. Literally, self-insert Bible fanfiction except where the self-insert Mary Sue character is a slave-owning soldier. <laughs> so Dave Nelius witnessed this healing miracle, he obviously believed in him, but then coincidentally and unfortunately, he was then leading the soldiers who were supposed to execute Jesus. The drama! You couldn't write this shit. Except you could, and probably make it more convincing. He couldn't do it because he could sense the love from Jesus, so he walked off. <laughs> We cut briefly back to AJ for another, more graphic description of his crucifixion. He tells us why he was nailed to the cross in like specific areas. It's grim! <laughs> back to Dave Nelius, who was disemboweled for his crimes of not crucifying Jesus. Birds were eating his stomach and then he died and felt peaceful. This poor fucking guy. On to Mary. Mary tells us she wanted to be present at the execution. A Jesus didn't want her to be there, but she was adamant. She is so emotional in this part, I hate it. I hate seeing the suffering of these people, knowing that almost certainly they wouldn't be here or have these horrific memories if AJ hadn't started the whole thing. Something that is especially striking in this part of the documentary is how harrowing these experiences are and how emotionally distressed these people are juxtaposed with a very calm and clinical AJ. Once again, I draw no conclusions here. I'm simply pointing out what I'm seeing. AJ tells us he foretold his death and resurrection to his followers. He based his three-day resurrection calculation on how long it would take him to decompose his own body. Kinda weird that Jesus Christ has the power to do that and resurrect, but it takes three days to charge up. Thomas is good here. He asks the right questions, in my opinion. He gently provokes AJ into telling him exactly how he sped up his own decomposition. When AJ says it's about knowing the processes involved and he channeled more oxygen into his body, 
Thomas asks how he provided that oxygen, and AJ gives a predictably wishy-washy answer about how everything is energy. Good try, Thomas. AJ then pulled matter together to form a body. Sure, why not? AJ appeared to Mary first, and though he was with her spiritually a lot, apparently she was still struggling with the concept of the physical versus the spiritual world. AKA, she was still extremely distressed. Thomas wants to know what this spiritual world is, and starts off by asking, whemst is it located? To which AJ starts his reply with the brilliant, Well, mathematically... Oh boy, here we go. Hit me with that mathematics, AJ. I've proven that we there, there are 13 or so concurrent dimensional spaces in the universe. There are 13 concurrent dimensional spaces in the universe. Let me see what I can find with the internet. God bless 21st century technology. Or should I say AJ bless? Okay, I'm struggling to find any sources that aren't blogs about spirituality. It might be related to string theory. String theories, I believe, require extra dimensions for the maths to work, I think. So apparently different string theories use 11 and 26 dimensions. Where are these 13 dimensions? I can't find anything. Regardless, I strongly suspect the word proven is being used incorrectly here. Monkey see, monkey do. Let's try this with the whiteboard. Maybe it'll help. They know that there's dark matter, which weighs, has a weight. So far, the answer to where is the spirit realm located begins Mathematically, they have proven there are 11 dimensions and dark matter exists. Not promising. And in fact, dark matter forms 90 to 95% of the known weight of the universe. Okay. Okay, not to be that guy, but the NASA website disagrees. It says here that roughly 68% of the universe is dark energy. Dark matter makes up about 27%. Now, Jesus here claims to know all these things because he's a spiritual being. So, being wrong or having outdated mathematics or physics knowledge is surely out of the question, so what's going on here? There's all this matter that exists in another dimensional space. I see where this is going. Okay, so because some studies and some scientists theorise that dark matter could be explained by a fourth dimension, note fourth, not thirteenth or whatever, AJ's layman's understanding of dimensions is interpreting that as like another place where spirits can hang out. Any physicists in the comments? Help us out. Please, God, help us. AJ concludes by explaining that heaven and hell, uh, quick side note, that means in AJ's version of reality, where everyone's gotten God all wrong and he's actually all about love, hell does still exist. Process that in your own time. Heaven and hell and all that other stuff are just other dimensions that our spirit bodies can live in. Well, thank you, AJ, for clearing that up. This turns into AJ debunking or explaining ghosts and spiritual phenomena, the paranormal to us, because that might as well be part of this insane afterlife theory as well. Apparently when your spirit body moves on from your dead actual body, you still have all your loves from life, so most people will quickly learn how to manipulate things and communicate with their loved ones in order to let them know that they're alright. By very slightly nudging spirit balls, I guess. Good news everyone! AJ believes in dinosaurs. And what's more... So do you believe dinosaurs roamed the world? Definitely. I know for certain because I've seen them in the spirit world. Good news, pal. Dinosaurs have souls. AJ explains that everything on Earth that has a central nervous system also has a spirit body. Rest in peace, sponges. AJ says that when you use your spirit body as your primary function, which is a sentence that... I guess technically makes sense. You can go to places where there are dinosaurs and Thomas looks so excited. Me, honestly. Maybe Thomas just really likes dinosaurs and this is what sold him on AJ's whole thing. Now Thomas meets up with another Divine Truth follower, Pete, who has been seeing spirits since he was a toddler. Pete tells us that the easiest way to be open to spirits is to be depressed or to use drugs and alcohol. So that's my Friday night sorted. He also goes on to claim that the reason for the best rock music, etc., in the world, is that the artists got high or drunk or whatever, and then spirits wrote the music for them. Which is weird, because one of the bands most notorious for using drugs to write their music is Oasis. I'm just kidding, I actually love Oasis. Roast me in the comments, I don't care. But yeah, David Bowie, Kurt Cobain, Bob Dylan, all hacks! Spirits wrote their songs. Source, Pete. <laughs> we briefly meet another Divine Truther who I did not put on the board because we barely see him in this awkward sort of uh, dinner setting. He helps Pete channel spirits once a week. He tells Thomas over dinner about how he once 
channel the spirit of, I'm trying to think of a YouTube friendly way of saying it, an explodey self unaliver. It feels like we've gone off the rails at this point, right? <laughs> I guess the point of all this is to hammer in the idea that divine truth followers have quite extreme delusions. Although again, by the end of the documentary, it doesn't feel like that's what they're trying to say. So I don't know, maybe it's literally just like, wow, this is weird. Let's put that in the documentary. I found myself listening to things that before this documentary began, I would have disregarded out of hand. Here we go. Here's Thomas getting sucked into the cult. What is it about these people's personal descriptions of their delusions that is convincing him? Is it because AJ says mathematically sometimes? So weird. Bizarrely, Thomas then says he wanted to find out if, according to AJ, hell exists. Since AJ already addressed that, I get the impression that as Thomas is being sucked in, he wants reassurance that it really is all nicey-nicey love-love in this cult. The hills of the spirit world are the first dimension. Hmm, those are all words strung together in a sentence. Hang on, let me have a go. The chefs of New York are apex predators. According to AJ, this is like my new catchphrase, the first dimension of passing, which I assume is cult Jesus for the place you go when you die. This is probably actually a good time to point out that Unique Language is one of the main cult or cult-like organisation signifiers. Again, I will leave a link to this source for you down in the description. I'm just going to read out a couple of sentences. Cultish language has ulterior motives and it's there to make communication hazier. It's there to divide people, to shut down independent thinking. That's how you know that language is cultish, when it causes a strong emotional response, but you yourself have trouble translating what it is that you're saying. For example, Scientology. We talked about this last week, and in the past Heaven's Gate, they use scientific sounding language. Say if you were a Scientologist, even if you were able to take a secret trip to a therapist, which is very unlikely, how are you going to explain to them the distress that all your body thetans are causing you? That's the power of language, baby. Back to the Hell Dimensions. Apparently they're in a bad condition at the moment. They're dark and smelly, there's not much autonomy because people there don't understand the movement of matter. Just more of AJ's culty language. Roughly I believe this translates to what he was saying about being able to move matter to decompose his body and people floating cups around for their loved ones. The Hells are also, to quote AJ, very much governed by the things they did on Earth. This definitely hits the instill fear portion of emotional control under the bite model. So if you do things on Earth that are out of harmony with love... I really think we should construct our own glossary of terms for the Divine Truth cult. I think that would help. Next time one of my friends comes to me with an emotional problem, I'm just going to tell them they're out of harmony with love. Now there is a weird as hell moment where AJ gives this example of someone on Earth committing murder. By the way, God's definition of murder is very different to our own. Okay. What is God's definition? Would it not be helpful to share that with the group, AJ? It's just a little tease. Like, wouldn't you like to know what God's idea of right and wrong is? Subscribe to Divine Truth to find out. Disgusting. This is how we define murder in the UK, by the way. Murder is committed when a person of sound mind unlawfully kills another person and they have the intention to kill or to cause grievous bodily harm. I mean, that sounds right to me, but I'm just an idiot who's out of harmony with God on love, so there we go. We get a bit of an explanation when AJ reveals that from God's perspective, abortion is murder. <laughs> now the important part, how to get out of hell. Hell is not permanent. Rather, our souls are attracted to the location that best suits our current soul condition. Unless you are an extremely kind, generous, altruistic person who has lived a beautiful, spiritual life and has also had an abortion, I guess. I don't make the rules. AJ the Australian IT guy does. I hate cults, man. AJ goes on to explain that the hells are all grey. But even as you get to the top of the first dimension, the top of the first dimension. Again, physicists, you try and work that one out. As you get to the top, it gets more colourful. The second dimension is unimaginable to us. So whatever, I guess. AJ wraps up this cheery hell discussion by reminding us that we can change our condition at any time. Even while here on Earth, and that's what he recommends doing. Subscribe to Divine Truth. When AJ talks to me about Divine Truth beliefs, something is either a truth or it's not. Hmm. Interesting. Next, Thomas challenges, if you can call it that, AJ on the offence his beliefs probably cause other religions. Chiefly the notion that all other religions are wrong and silly because God's word has been distorted. Wait a second. 
AJ, this is funny, AJ criticises most religions on Earth for being created by people to suppress and control. Which is a bold thing for a cult leader employing thought-stopping techniques to say. I really do think he believes what he preaches, which makes him a very dangerous man. Thomas rounds up a few of AJ's core beliefs here, namely that God creates everyone with a pure soul, but those souls are degraded by the actions of our grandparents and all that bollocks. Make sure we've got soul condition in the bullshit glossary, will you? Thank you. Jesus apparently came to know God and be able to perform miracles by cleansing his soul. So why can't AJ perform miracles? Firstly, the logic of that question defies logic. Does it? I don't see how. If you are Jesus Christ and you proved that in the past by performing miracles, why don't you perform a miracle now to prove yourself again? That seems perfectly fucking logical to me. If a person can perform a miracle, the only thing it proves is that they can perform that miracle that they've performed. Okay, but AJ, if you could perform a miracle, it would provide some evidence that you are more than just an IT guy turned cult leader. This is an insane attempt at thought stopping. Cult fail. AJ goes on to say that he could only perform miracles between 30 and 33, aka between when he was at one with God and dead for the first time. Also, he only chose to perform a miracle, he uses the example of curing a blind person's vision, if he really wants to and feels a lot of love for them. Which is not very Christ-like. I'm surprised, like when he said religions have got it all wrong, he implied that God is actually more loving. But it turns out that Jesus is more of an asshole than we thought and would only help people if he really felt like it. What a cunt. I'm allowed to say that because I'm English and he's Australian. Basically, AJ was at one with God. Then he died, which he knew would happen. But now he's got too many fears to become one with God again just yet. Sounds like a convenient excuse for a delusional Jesus Christ impersonator looking for reasons why he can't perform miracles. Now it's day two of the seminar and Thomas wants to talk to more Divine Truth followers, which means get ready to be fucking furious at AJ and his disgusting teachings once again. I wish there was more from followers in this documentary. We don't see very many. I don't really count Mary because she's kind of used as an extension of AJ and she hasn't said much independent from him anyway. We saw that one guy outside the seminar before, Dave from the first century and spirit guy Pete, and now 10 minutes before the end, we're finally getting another one. This is my main issue with this documentary. Like most of the information, the majority of the information comes from the cult leader. And it is contradictory in some places with what his followers say about his teachings. That's why it's so important to hear from members. So many of our, is it a cult questions are impossible to answer without access to the inside. Is there information withheld from the public? Is there emotional abuse happening? We can't just ask AJ and take his word for it, but that is 90% of this documentary. The lady we're here from next, I'm pretty confident we don't get her name, but forgive me if I'm wrong. She tells us she thinks she's been part of a cult before. Uh-oh! I find this very interesting. She says that with AJ and Mary, they encourage free will but teach you to identify what is loving and unloving. Again, those words don't mean what we would associate with them. That language is specific to this group. Love, loving, unloving, they have a specific meaning in divine truth that is not what we would know it to mean. Based on everything I've seen here, in my opinion, I would say divine truth opts for emotional manipulation rather than strict rules and regulations. I'd say it's just a different tactic and maybe a less controlling one than other cults, but bad nonetheless. I'm, I'm pretty mediumistic. Oh no. This is our second divine truther who has spiritual powers. Weird, isn't it? How some of these divine truth followers seem to have more powers than Jesus Christ reincarnated. She says that it's been really nice to talk to AJ and Mary about things she's never had answers for, and I bet you they have answers for everything. Any experience you've had, any question you've had, Divine Truth has the answer for you. How lucky you are. Once again, a member of this group gets emotional recalling the distressing experiences AJ and Mary and Divine Truth force them to ruminate on. Here's Emma's personal suggestion for red flags about organisations. If every single member you speak to cries discussing their experiences, that's a red fucking flag. Divine Truth targets people who are already susceptible to magical thinking or cults, who maybe already have delusions, and or are working through some traumatizing experience and looking for answers. This lady also briefly reveals that she has struggled with addiction as well as the troubles her mediumship has caused her. Thomas, rather than getting to the bottom of her relationship with Divine Truth, thinks it would make great telly to ask if there are any divine spirits around us now. That's fine, just I would maybe have done both. I don't know. I'm tired. She asks for a minute to feel about 
and surprise, surprise, she says, yeah, there are, and immediately gets upset again. I hate this man. I'm fucking sick of seeing people crying. I beg everyone in this documentary to get away from divine truth and onto the armchair of a good therapist. I'm not gonna tell you about the spirits that she feels around because I don't think it matters. We know she has kooky beliefs, haha -ha, TV so funny. I am angry at AJ for starting a cult and dragging these people into this situation. I am angry at Thomas for seeing a woman in distress, for alleging that he is talking to people to find out if they're in a cult and then dedicating his time to asking them about their weird spiritual beliefs. Oh, are there any spirits around me and my camera guy? You're supposed to be uncovering a potential cult, you fucking cunt. <coughs> Next up, a recent convert, Marion. She has also been plagued with spirits her entire life. She tells us about some of the amazing visions that spirits have given her. The negative side, however, well, I'll just let her explain. Being told you're made of titanium after you've crashed a car and sending you down a cliff and your face smashing in, your leg being ripped apart, thinking that you're fine and, and going to the hospital and showing the doctors what's inside your leg and like really warped stuff. That was a real incident that she followed with a couple of weeks in psychiatric hospital. At least she doesn't cry telling the story, I guess. She says that AJ and Mary are probably the most advanced mediums on the planet, which is weird because we've seen no evidence of that. Seems like another hint that there is information that only people inside Divine Truth are privy to. If you were being open and honest and trying to convince people that you're Jesus Christ in this documentary, surely, surely you would at least mention those mediumship powers. Very sus that AJ and Mary have kept silent about that. Thomas says he's beginning to understand why people have chosen this spiritual path because their delusions are compatible with divine truth, because they're in desperate situations and emotional states that make them vulnerable to manipulation. No, no, it's all about hope and love. If I speak to the divine truth followers, they all say it isn't a cult. No shit. It's like, is he just an idiot? Like, of course they deny they're in a cult. If they thought they were in a cult, they wouldn't fucking be there. If you'd interviewed the people of Jonestown, they'd all have told you it wasn't a cult. Is he actually a moron? Did he walk away with a stack of Divine Truth DVDs? The end of the documentary is just this. Thomas talking over friendly folk music about how these people are seeking guidance, AJ doesn't want to be a cult leader, and Thomas doesn't think that he is. <gasps> Thomas very briefly acknowledges, I'll just repeat it word for word, I don't think he is, but it does put him in a position of power. How does Thomas address this? Literally minutes from the end of the documentary, by asking AJ and Mary directly if there's any truth to the cult leader claims. I guess this would be fine if he'd made any attempt to find out through other sources, but again, this is 99% Thomas asking the alleged cult leader if he's a cult leader and taking his word for it when he says no. What does that prove? If there was an award, for the worst attempt at investigative journalism, I swear to God. They laugh and laugh about how silly these claims are, specifically only relating to sex and marriage. No, he's only sucked in this one woman by convincing her she's Mary Magdalene and helping her create these false memories. So it's all good. Probably needless to say, none of this means anything because it's all coming from AJ. If you're trying to find out if somebody is a cult leader, and you only take the alleged cult leader's word for it, at face value, what the fuck do you learn? Now, at some point in our future, there's gonna be one person who claims to be Jesus who's actually Jesus. No, I'm sorry. There's a serious lack of foundation to that insane claim. To make that claim legitimate, you'd need proof that resurrection is possible, proof that the specific Jesus AJ is talking about existed, which we do not have, even if we had that proof, we'd still have no reason for assuming his inevitable resurrection, especially when AJ also claims that the Bible and all religions are wrong. So this idea that Jesus is real and has to come back eventually, so keep your eyes peeled for the right one, me, that's fucking ludicrous. Back to the gentle guitar music, footage of Thomas hugging Mary and AJ goodbye, Thomas saying again how silly those lies about AJ are, how everyone he's met has been so nice. He even says, Thomas says that if everyone was like the followers of divine truth, the world would be a much nicer place. Which is exactly the sort of thing someone who's fallen for a cult would say. It's not for me to question people's belief systems, Thomas says, especially when they're based on love. Literally every religion and cult in the world will tell you their system is based on love. 
and yet having any kind of abortion is considered murder to this loving god. Hells exist, and it's people's own fault they go there. The enforcing of this negative idea that even your family members' actions can cause terrible things in your life is the antithesis of love. Love, in divine truth, does not mean what love means to the rest of the world. It is a smokescreen that this fucking idiot fell for amazingly easily. He folded like a bloody card after five minutes of this dickhead being charismatic, something that someone going to investigate a potential cult leader should have been prepared for. AJ certainly believes he's doing it for the love of God. Awful. One star. Can we give less than one star? Fuck this documentary. So it's over, but here's where we get the interesting bit, my lovelies. Despite the happy, clappy, it's all good presentation of this idiotic documentary, the cult leaders, sorry, divine truth leaders, weren't happy with it. And once more to the bite model. Now he realises, finally, this also, to me anyway, my personal reading, implies that Thomas was seeking their approval throughout the documentary. I think one possible interpretation of events is Thomas met these people. He was love bombed to shit. He was blown away by how charismatic and charming and funny they were. He got sucked in by the fact that there have been false claims about them. He heard the word love over and over again. And as happens to most cult members, he became desperate for the approval of the people at the top. Lol. <laughs> What a fantastic waste of time. This dude, Thomas Leader, alleged that he was going to investigate whether or not Divine Truth was a cult. What he actually did was defer to the alleged cult leader for almost all of his information, make a documentary putting them in an unreasonably positive light, sucked up to them, met their disapproval with the documentary and realised that they're actually manipulative about any form of criticism, but it was too late to address that so they released this really positive documentary about them anyway. Actual clown town. I'm sure it was a lot of work. Most likely they had a deal with some kind of broadcast company to release this. I don't give a fuck. I would not let this documentary go out in the state that it's in. That one statement at the end is not good enough. I'd be like, oh my god, I fucked up. I got sucked in. Put that disclaimer at the beginning because how many people turn off when the ending music starts playing? As soon as text appears on the screen. If shit's on Netflix, it's gonna minimise so people can't read it anyway. Put that shit at the beginning. Investigate further. Reach out to more people. If you can't hit anything but a dead end, at least get another clip of yourself talking about the aftermath and your realisations. This is so... To me, this is so, so deeply irresponsible. Like, can you see why this doc made me so angry? Or do you think I'm overreacting? Let's just put up the bite model with the things that I have covered highlighted, and then maybe this list of cult leader traits with the ones that we're aware of highlighted. Again, it's very hard to properly analyse this because the documentary is so biased because it does not do a thorough investigation because it relies so much on the cult's perspective. It's kind of hard to come to any sort of conclusion other than this is a terrible documentary. Woo! We did it. Tell you what, that is a weight off my mind. <laughs> I really, I really didn't enjoy that documentary. There are bits of it where Thomas asks good questions, there are bits of it where it's well put together. Overall, I think the the narrative is all over the place, whether it's to do with the whether that's the editing or the directing or both, I don't. It's just very all over the place, going back and forth between things and people. It's kind of confusing. And then you've got all these cyclical moments where you've heard something before. Or Thomas is like, I wanted to find out this. And you're like, but you found that out five minutes ago. <laughs> just overall a bad experience. Do you feel the same way? Or do you think I'm just grumpy because of the heat? You can tell me. I can take it. Please do let me know your thoughts down below, give the video a cheeky like, subscribe so you don't miss more stuff like this, it all really really helps, I'm just a silly little bean, I'm doing this all on my own and it's hard work. So your support is so greatly appreciated, if you do enjoy what I do here and you'd like to help support me make more uh, goofy stuff, the best way to do that is via the Patreon, get some exclusive videos and posts and there's some postcards and I don't know, there's, there's stuff. This stuff, you can check it out. You can also become a channel member right here. You get some very silly emotes. You get comment priority, which means I will always read your comments. If you'd like to hear more from me, I have another channel at Emma Thorn Backstage where I do more lifestyle-y 
vloggy, vibey silliness. I also have a gaming channel at Little Duck Gaming. I just played through a game called Frog's Adventure. You don't want to miss that shit. I also stream live on Twitch at Emma Little Duck. It's a good place to come and say hi live. Everyone is very nice over there. Before we go, I must give a big old thank you and a shout out to my giant chickens and colossal quackers over on Patreon. <laughs> Have yourselves a very lovely week, and I will see you really soon.